Without further ado, I would like to introduce Brandon Pace, FAIA, a founding partner of Sanders Pace Architecture in Knoxville, Tennessee, and the AIA Ohio 2020 Design Awards Jury Chair. With work that is extensively researched and thoughtfully executed, Brandon has become a critical voice for a region and context often overlooked. I know I'm excited to hear what he has to say. Brandon? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction and uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, I'll say it was an honor to serve as a chair of this year's Design Awards jury. We had a lot of fun uh, on the jury and I'm looking forward to sharing a little bit about us, our firm and our process as well. And I'm a little bit disappointed. Um, I was hoping to make a trip. I think it was supposed to be in Dayton this year. Um, so you know, we'll have to do, make do with what we've got with Zoom. And I know that we're all a little bit Zoom fatigued, so I'll try to not keep you too long today. Um, and let me share my screen real quick. Uh, let's see. Okay, I guess everybody can see that. Okay, perfect. So um, what I wanna do today is share a, a story about the place where, uh, where we live and work, the context we work with every day. And I wanna, think about context in a little bit broader way. So beyond just the physical aspect, but um, to think about it uh, in, in other ways and include things like the history of a building or place, or even the political, social, cultural circumstances that might've led to the formation of that place in the first place. Um, you know, these, these uh, stories have an equal hand in shaping the work that we do. And we try to be really deliberate about working that uh, into our own design process. So this is, this is where we live and work, um, Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, Knox County is located in the valley between the Cumberland Plateau and the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Um, it's, a, uh, no, it's not a huge place. You can drive about 15 minutes in any direction and be from downtown to be in a pretty rural place. So it's a, it's a varied landscape um, for sure. And our, our firm isn't really, we're not a national practice. We're really not even a regional practice. Um, and I'd say we, we've kind of accepted the fact that we're we're uh, acutely local and we used to have a bit of a chip on our shoulders. We jump at the opportunity to work in different contexts and try to do different things. But nowadays I'd say we're more um, unapologetically local. We like working within our own context. We like working on places um, and having a direct impact on the places where we live, work and play. And, um, and I think that's a kind of a unique opportunity that we have in a mid-sized city like Knoxville that might not exist in other places. Uh, larger urban places, you might have the red tape and bureaucracy that comes along with trying to execute projects. Smaller rural areas don't have the populations and with that the kind of tax base and revenue that comes with it that can uh, support some of the projects that um, things that that we're working on. Um, so Knoxville uh, historically, I guess, has, you know, struggled to define its own identity, I'll just say, especially in the second half of the 20th century. Um, it's, it's been a pretty transient place. So you have people who might spend a weekend here, they might spend four or five years here while they're in school. They might pass through Knoxville on the way to other destinations within the region. Um, but it wasn't really all that, uh, that way historically. And really over the past 20 years or so, we started to kind of find ourselves and get comfortable with some of the things that, um, some of the things that we really tried to hide from in the past. Uh, some of the challenges and flaws that we saw, we've now seen as opportunities. And some of these things have really become the foundation of a new period of growth for our city. So uh, this afternoon, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna, I'm gonna zoom in and talk about this area and share a few stories, which hopefully will give some insight into our work and our process and how we fit into this broader context. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping and thinking that some of these stories are universal. Uh, I think you'll find some similarities in places where some of you uh, work as well. So I wanna start with a little bit of background as a firm, we're really interested in history. We're fascinated by the stories of the places we work um, the legacies of the people who came before us and the places that, that they left behind. We'll start here back in 1886. Um, Knoxville, after the Civil War, it was a leading uh, city in the post-Civil War New South. We had uh, strong union sympathies. We had a, an abundance of natural resources. We had a lot of people moving into the city uh, from the surrounding rural areas. The population in Knoxville was 10,000 in 1880. And by 1890, it had nearly tripled, and that was really of the growth of industry in the area. We had about 100 factories built between 1880 and 1890. And these were uh, steel mills and machine shops and some of the textile mills as well. And the textile mills would be an important uh, part of, of the kind of growth of our city and how our uh, city expanded into the uh, surrounding areas. Um, and as the, 
as these kind of surrounding areas continued to grow, our downtown grew along with it. Market Square was the heart of our city uh, at that time. And just a block away, Gay Street was the center of entertainment and commerce. And these, these pictures were taken in around 1930. Um, and the Great Depression was on the horizon. Knoxville wasn't spared. Um, we, uh, I guess, as, as banks began to close and uh, people began to lose their jobs, unemployment was soaring. We were left with a city that the writer John Gunther came and visited. Um, and, and he called it the ugliest city in America in uh, the mid-1940s. By the end of the 1940s, we had started our steep decline of industry within the area. And with, um, with the jobs gone and federal funding in place, um, like the 1958 Interstate Act, we saw people more and more start to leave the inner city for the northern and western suburbs that were being, uh, that were being built around Knoxville. And this is a common story to other cities in the country. Uh, in places like New York, you had Jane Jacobs um, fighting to uh, protect the historic fabric of American cities, fighting people like Robert Moses who were pushing an urban renewal agenda. But in Knoxville, we didn't have somebody like uh, Jane Jacobs. And we, we saw that uh, without a voice like this, we saw the landscape of our city forever change. It's from 19, the 1930s uh, through the 1960s, we saw um, the interstates come through further dislocate our neighborhoods from our, from our urban areas and really hasten their decline. And then moving back downtown in areas like Market Square, we saw the beginnings of uh, people trying to kind of revitalize the spaces. We, we saw projects like the Market Square Mall and the Gay Street Promenade, uh, which the Gay Street Promenade literally turned its back on Gay Street and tried to create a new type of urbanism that prioritized uh, the automobile uh, over, over pedestrians. And just 20 years after that, we tried something else. Uh, the 1982 World's Fair brought in a whole lot of people into Knoxville, uh, including at that time, Ronald Reagan, the sitting president of the United States. It was a really big deal, but um, fast forward 20 years and all we're left from that are a bunch of souvenirs and a, a market square, a downtown area that looked like this when, when we started our firm in 2002. But all the embodied energy and spirit and history of this place was, was still there. Um, and that's what really started or inspired us to start our own firm. Um, but through the efforts over the next 20 years, about from you know 2000 to right now, through the efforts of a whole lot of different people, we've seen uh, downtown Knoxville and Market Square really um, recapture its its uh, its place as a vibrant center uh, of downtown, heart of our city, and place for civic discourse, uh, protests like the Women's March in 2017, uh, place for places for cultural exchanges as well. This is. Uh, Rhiannon Giddens busking in between performances during uh, the 2019 Big Years Music Festival. And then on Gay Street, we've seen that same kind of pattern of, of development happen um, as the storefront started to become uh, re-inhabited. And um, you know, we've seen that through our own firm as well, through a couple of projects that, that we finished in our office uh, that are about three blocks apart and about 13 years apart in the history of our firm. Um, and these projects are, are kind of start in a pretty similar way. They're, historic buildings that work in concert with other buildings um, along the block to create the backdrop of life uh, within the city. But over the course of the, um, you know, the, the 20th century, you saw a lot of change happen to these buildings, either by fire or whims of fashion. You saw the buildings begin to be transformed uh, until eventually being neglected or abandoned by the end of the, of the 20th century, just really isolated empty remnants of the history of, of the place. Again, the, the bones and the, the kind of history and memory of these buildings are still there and they're just waiting patiently for a new use. So we really see our work as, as the next chapter in the evolution of these buildings that are you know, going to continue to change over time. Um, these buildings have always been an essential part of our urban fabric and their transformation plays a key role in the revitalization of our cities. So these are a couple of downtown projects, but our our work more recently has moved beyond downtown. As, as redevelopments gain momentum, we've tried to extend this same attitude outside into some of those urban neighborhoods. Some of them that were, you know, just like these buildings, neglected, abandoned, in some cases, even removed totally uh, over the second half of the 20th century. So these are places like uh, North Knoxville. Um, North Knoxville was an area that really fueled some of our earliest expansion as a city. Um, we had, uh, 14, I believe, uh, large mills and other types of factories alone, which employed scores of people uh, in and around the area and really supported the neighborhoods in these areas. These were places like Brookside Mills. This is a textile mill. This is the largest one, 14 acres under roof um, at this building. And at its height, it employed about a thousand people. So these are men, women, and children um, whose 
jobs dependent on the mill and whose neighborhoods dependent on the, uh, the jobs of these people. And so the textile mill, again, was a really big part of Knoxville's history. Uh, 1936, it was the top industry in Knoxville, employed the most people in the city. But just 20 years later, 1956, we saw Brookside, the, the largest of those mills, close down. And uh, by, the, by the end of the 1950s, you really saw most of the industry in Knoxville, in North Knoxville, uh, either leave, go to another place, or just it was gone forever, gone for good. And it left um, once thriving commercial corridors. This is a building at the intersection of Central and Broadway, which I'll talk more about in a little bit. Um, it left these, these vibrant spaces of empty, abandoned, um, and uh, you know, neglected remnants um, in our city. And it left the commercial corridors too that pass through these areas, Central and Broadway, um, scattered with a, a slew of uh, predatory lending businesses, pawn shops, fast food restaurants along, along Broadway. And along Central, you had just a string of abandoned uh, storefronts. But we've been part of a, a renewed focus within this area, again, Central and Broadway, that's that intersection I talked about. There's been a renewed focus in recent years uh, in these areas. Um, which has led to significant uh, transformations in some of these buildings. They've been adapted and transformed to accommodate new uses, breathing life into some of these neighborhoods and bringing activity into these spaces. Uh, these buildings were some of those machine shops and automobile dealerships and things like that, which were um, vacant buildings, but they were buildings that were built to last and they were buildings with uh, an inherent flexibility that allows them to accommodate new uses pretty easily. Um, these new uses, things like coffee shops and other neighborhood gathering spaces uh, within the area. And we've, uh, this type of small scale developments continued to gain momentum. In this case, uh, moving further up central, we were able to, uh, to work with a local production company, restaurant and brewery to transform a, a block of vacant buildings, which has brought a new life um, and activity and revitalization to this, to this part of the city um, with uh, new businesses that provide jobs, and provide amenities for those surrounding neighborhoods and also um, even a, a place to, to grab a beer. So this is kind of a, a quick run through some pretty modest interventions uh, in our city that have had a, a I think a big impact. Um, so I want to I want to dive a little bit deeper into a couple of projects that are a little bit larger scale um, projects that we've been working on over a longer time period. And it'll give a little bit of insight into our approach uh, and our process in these, in these types of projects. So I'm gonna move across the river to South Knoxville. Um, it's a place that um, is undergoing rapid change right now. There's a lot happening in South Knoxville, but it's also a place that has some of our earliest recorded history. So this is, uh, this is Orlando Poe. He was a union general and a map maker. He, he left us with some, some amazing drawings, um, maps of fortifications, union, and Confederate fortifications in and around Knoxville during the Civil War. So that gave us a good understanding really of, of what the um, landscape looked like at that time. The rugged terrain of South Knoxville, it, it, um, it made it a good, a good part or a key part of the fortifications. It was protecting from an advance, Confederate advance from the South coming up from, from Atlanta and Chattanooga. Um, so those, those forts you can see uh, here, these are a picture of downtown Knoxville during the Civil War. Another picture looking uh, towards Fort Byington, which Fort Byington is the main building on what would later become the University of Tennessee's campus. And the one at the top is uh, a view of these hills at the, at the back that, uh, that protected from that Confederate advance. So by the 1920s, um, those same hills served as a backdrop for some of the development that was coming along the banks of the river. Um, you can also see in this photo the construction of the Southern Railway Bridge, which connected to Knoxville to important shipping centers uh, within the South. And like other areas of the city, the South Knoxville was industry was going strong at that time. We had um, we had all the industry that was happening along the river. We also had along that Southern Railway line different development that was happening uh, in areas like Vestal in South Knoxville, um, and these were. Uh, you know, companies like uh, Kendor Marble Company. Marble, the marble industry was a really big deal in Knoxville at the time. I'm sure some of you have probably worked with Tennessee Marble before. So um, Tennessee Marble was quarried for some pretty important buildings, the Morgan Library in New York, the, uh, 
the uh, uh, the National Gallery in Washington, D.C., the lions that are outside the Na uh, New York Public Library near Bryant Park, those were all quarried and shaped um, in and around this area in South Knoxville. The Candora Marble Company was probably the most famous of these. And this is a showroom that they built in 1926 to showcase, showcase the work of their craftsmen. Um, and unfortunately, though, the same kind of pattern of, of uh, of industry leaving the area happened as from the 50s to the 60s to the 70s we saw all of these industries begin to leave taking with them the jobs that supported the people within these middle class neighborhoods and we had um, companies like Andor Marble Company these proud companies uh, leave and leave these relics post-industrial relics um, that began to be overtaken by nature and those quarries that uh, where all this stone came from had long since been abandoned and filled with water. Uh, but by 2001, this is a quarry, the Meads quarry, it was a Tennessee marble quarry, pink marble quarry. 2001, this, uh, the county, Knox County, purchased this quarry and cleanup began. And this became a big part of, uh, you know, an effort that I'll talk a lot about in a little bit. So this was, this was a, um, a quarry that uh, has become a recreation destination and an important site that tells this little bit of history about Knoxville's past, which is, which is great. And it's, it's located within um, what's been called Knoxville's urban wilderness. So the urban wilderness I'm going to talk about for the, the rest of the time here. It's a collection of sites and a group of stakeholders that are committed to preserving some of uh, Knoxville's historic, cultural, and recreational spaces. Um, so we're involved in, in several of these projects and I'm going to talk here about some that are at the western end of the battlefield or of the uh, of the urban wilderness, and I'll move over to the eastern end a little bit later. So the the first project within this area is a it's a planning project. We started it in 2016. Um, we were working with a, a group called Port Urbanism, their Chicago office. And if you don't know uh, them, you should look them up. They're a wonderful uh, landscape urbanism firm. That's really uh, great and helpful in helping us kind of dig into some of the history of these places and develop some of the spaces within that. So uh, we were hired to look at the area west of Chapman Highway, which is Chapman Highway is, is Broadway, the same road as it leaves downtown, it turns into Chapman Highway as it moves uh, south. So we were, we were hired to look at this uh, area, which includes a number of disconnected historical and cultural sites, some of those uh, post-industrial ruins, and a, a kind of smattering of neighborhoods as well. And when we started the project, we inherited the name Battlefield Loop, um, which is kind of ironic because the site, it's neither a battlefield nor a loop. Um, most of Knoxville's action during the uh, Civil War happened right over here in a place called Fort Sanders. Um, but this area was still interesting because it did have those, those Civil War forts and also the site of a skirmish in 1863. Um, so this, this is a, a little bit of a zoom of General Poe's maps. So this is Fort Byington looking, this is the view looking towards those those forts. And those same forts here, this is Fort Stanley and Fort Dickerson as the backdrop of some of that uh, industrial development that would happen throughout the 20th century. But, you know, with those businesses gone, uh, what remained was these collection of post-industrial sites and the now reforested hills of South Knoxville, which uh, still really limited um, the opportunity for development within the area. And it made, it made access to a collection of these kind of important but isolated sites really difficult. But by the beginning of the 2000s, probably, we started to see a pattern of development happen within this area, this kind of backdrop of, of, our, of our city. Um, it was a viral development with uh, substandard student housing projects that began to kind of creep into some of these, some of these wonderful spaces. And these were student housing projects that promised uh, students, their parents, whatever, an opportunity to live big and treat yourself. And they had things like uh, 20, 20 foot jumbotrons and 30 person hot tubs. And this one has a lazy river that you can see right here. Um, so this, this was scheduled to occupy the entirety of the, of the hillside that's happening through here. But the, the wonderful and terrible thing that happened was um, the recession happened, and that seems like a distant memory now, but the recession happened. So around 2007, 2008, that type of development was, was stopped, and it gave an opportunity for people like um, the Aslan Foundation and uh, Legacy Parks to come in and purchase some of these pieces of property from those, uh, from those developers and preserve these for future generations. 
So with the donation of a property called the River Bluff property to the city of Knoxville, uh, 300 acres of this area was under control. Downtown's just right over here. 300 acres of this area was under control of either the city of Knoxville or the Aslan Foundation. And so during the Battlefield Loop project, what we did was we, we linked that with this industrial corridor, the Goose Creek corridor, uh, through this area and all those post-industrial sites and also the commercial sites along Chapman Highway. And so that helped us define the boundaries of what would become the Battlefield Loop. So in starting the project with, with Port, uh, we really started by zooming into five areas. So we wanted to zoom in and learn about those spaces, but we wanted, to, we wanted the planning effort to be a bottom-up planning effort rather than a top-down planning effort. Um, so we wanted to take into account the sites themselves, but also the users and activities so we can make informed decisions about the locations of key nodes, intersections, connection points that might happen that a top-down master planning approach uh, probably wouldn't let us do. Uh, so we, we studied the patterns of birding groups, hiking clubs, civil war aficionados, a number of other groups to identify areas within this 600 acre loop that these people might be interested in. And just kind of looking at one of these birding groups, um, what we did was we took each of these groups and we would identify, in this case, the bird species that these groups are interested in, uh, what types of habit, habitats do those birds uh, typically uh, flock to, and then where within the battlefield loop do these types of habitats exist. And what that did was it allowed us to start to create a, uh, a network of paths related to each of these user groups. Um, and then once we started to overlay each of these paths, we ended up with this kind of subway map of intensity of use within the battlefield loop, which helped us identify places for parking, bathrooms, kind of programming opportunities. It was these key nodes and intersections that would exist within the area. And so we took that data and started to develop that uh, a little bit more and um, start to program the space a little bit, program some of those nodes, nodes and um, connections, program some of the spaces themselves. And what that did was it allowed us to um, create budgets for projects that we could share with the city and start to help them prioritize funding for projects within the battlefield loop. So the first project that was prioritized for funding um, was a project called Augusta Quarry at Fort Dickerson Park. So this, this, is a, this is a quarry that was donated to the city, it was donated um, in the 1990s. And while accessing this water was very difficult, a lot of people would do it and swim illegally up until about, I think it was 2014 when this property was donated to the city. They began patrolling the property uh, and began letting people swim there legally. And that was great, but uh, the perimeter around this quarry has these steep bluffs that attract a lot of different people. It becomes a really dangerous setting. And this is one of the reason why, reasons why it's prioritized. There have been a lot of deaths that have happened there. So um, you know, bringing safety measures and bringing more people into the site became a priority for the city. And uh, I talked a little bit about Meads Quarry and uh, the history of the Tennessee pink, mar pink marble industry. So Meads became uh, this interpretive moment with interpretive signage that told the story about the um, marble industry in Knoxville. But uh, this quarry at, at Fort Dickerson, it was not a pink marble quarry. It's just the crushed limestone quarry. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's, it was not interesting. So as we started to dig into this a little bit and, and watch the evolution of the space over time, as it went from a hill that started to become eroded more and more and more until this once, what once was a hill became a hole within the landscape. And uh, another zoom of that, of that same Po map, you can really see that. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but Fort Dickerson is here, and this is the hill below that. This is the actual spot where this quarry was. So the key line of fortifications behind Fort Dickerson, which is the only remaining intact fort that we have uh, in Knoxville, that line of fortifications was forever lost to history. So while this was uh, an active quarry and while that work was happening, it was also an active um, place for other types of industry. We have, for instance, the, the woolen mill, Jefferson Mills, that was visible from Fort Dickerson. Also, all of the other industry that, um, that stretched along the river right at that spot. So what we came to conclude um, was that the, the history of the site, it really had, it had three lives. We had the you know, the, the time before the quarry, when it was, which includes the Civil War era. So this is when it was a pretty sparsely populated area. We have the industrial era, which is the about five decades or so that it was active as a quarry. 
And then we have the post-industrial era, which is uh, more or less the kind of sublime site that we find today. And so part of our, part of our jobs, I think, as architects are to, to bring these stories to life to people. This is a location within our city. It's about a mile from downtown, but it's a place that people don't know a lot about. They don't know, a lot of people don't even know it's there. So um, what we did was we wanted to bring people out to the site for a public meeting. Um, we wanted to share the beauty of the place. Uh, we also wanted to talk a little bit about the history of the place, but public meetings require public bathrooms. They require um, you know, accessibility uh, to these spaces. So we realized that that wasn't gonna be possible. So we um, made the decision to do what we thought was the next best thing. So um, you know, we, us in, in, in Port, uh, decided to prepare an exhibit and basically scale down the map of the quarry and create an interactive exhibit that people could experience. So they could experience this place without um, actually attending it. So we, we held that event inside uh, one of these abandoned industrial spaces on Chapman Highway um, and you know, brought all this information um, to people. And from that, we were able to then kind of start the project after getting uh, feedback from the, from the community. We developed a phasing strategy on the project, which um, in two phases, the first one dealt with uh, access and infrastructure, and the second uh, phase was dealing with uh, amenities. So uh, part of the access and infrastructure component included the development of a new, of a new parking lot. And this is the this is what it looked like beforehand. Um, this was the historic entry into the quarry. Um, so there were remnants of what happened with uh, circulation within that space. So we worked with kind of the footprint of some of the things that were already there. Also uh, proposing a 40, 40 or so car parking lot that also provided new connections into a trail system that closely mimicked the trail system that surrounded the existing quarry. And uh, this, the project opened last fall. Um, so it brings utilities down to the water uh, in anticipation of the future phase. It's a pretty simple project. It's a stone edged parking lot um, with a kind of a tar and chip gravel surface. Um, we have planting that's integrated, some of it existing and original kind of volunteer plants. And then we tried to enhance uh, that with uh, additional planting that closely resembles some of the things that we're finding within that space. And times are tough right now. Uh, funding's hard to come by, but we're working with the mayor and her administration right now to secure funding for that second phase of the project, which will include safety improvements around the perimeter of the quarry. It'll also include an accessible uh, access down to, to a boardwalk accessing water um, and a new, new comfort station and vendor kiosk as well. So uh, we're hoping to, to start work on this uh, next spring. So, there are a lot of sites within the battlefield loop. Um, identity and wayfinding is something that, that we struggle with and it's become a priority within the project. So um, we did develop a, uh, just a fairly simple core 10 steel sign at the entry into Augusta Quarry layered behind a core 10, or excuse me, a, a crab orchard stone uh, wall as the entry to the quarry. And uh, we started to, to kind of transfer this language into other sites that were already pre-existing sites within the battlefield loop. Uh, bringing that language of 410 steel uh, and stainless, or excuse me, milled aluminum letters into this as well. So we take the, in this case, we're trying to design freestanding versions of this of this sign. So we take the core 10 surface and start to fold and manipulate that and punch those uh, those aluminum letters out from that surface to give it a little bit of an added presence and identity within. So you can see these sites. There's one located right now at a, at the site of High Ground Park. Um, which is Fort Higley historically. There's another one at Fort Dickerson right now. So we're trying to create some continuity within what happens within these battlefield loop sites. So staying within the battlefield loop, I wanna move south from High Ground Park. So this is the next ridge uh, south of downtown. So this is probably about two miles from downtown Knoxville right now. Um, this is a project that we're working on with the Aslan Foundation and it just finished earlier this year. It's home now to an artist residency, um, and it's attracting writers, musicians, fine artists, and all to, uh, to Knoxville for residencies that last from two to eight weeks. But that wasn't always uh, the intention for this piece of property. This is, this is one of those sites that was slated for development until the recession hit. So in 2008, uh, the Aslan Foundation was able to come in and purchase this property from those developers, and they really didn't know what they wanted to do with the property at that time. They just know they wanted to preserve and protect this from development. 
uh, to maintain that historic kind of backdrop to our city. So the first thing Aslan did was commission a cultural landscape report. Um, and that started to dig into you know, evidence of settlement and development down um, into a place called Cherokee Cove, dating from the time of the Cherokee. Um, in the 20th century, the ridge itself began to be developed, first with a frame house, and then later on in the 1930s with a collection of log cabins that a lady named Missy Thompson uh, built as rental cabins. Um, in the 1950s, a couple of other log cabins, rental cabins, were, were added. Uh, by the time uh, Missy passed away, the property transferred ownership to different people. There were fraternities that, uh, with the University of Tennessee that had the entirety of the site, about a 100-acre site. Um, and later on, a, a group of kind of media people um, uh, with the Whittle, uh, Whittle Communications, which was a big deal in Knoxville at the time, they all had houses here as well. But by the time we were brought into the project, uh, but in 2014, this is the state of the cabin. So this is from a series of site visits that we uh, went to the property and documented the existing conditions of these cabins, which had suffered years of neglect, uh, deferred maintenance, and uh, just poorly constructed additions over the years. So you can, you can look at our website and our work and realize pretty quickly that we're not log cabin architects, but, um, but we do, uh, you know, we, <laughs> We, we were asked to make the cabin safe and comfortable. And so we, not knowing that, we wanted to make sure that we did everything right. So we looked uh, to the Civilian Conservation Corps, CCC cabins that were built in the 1930s as well. We looked at that for, uh, for inspiration. Um, and we also, uh, there weren't, the inhabitants here were not particularly noteworthy, but we still wanted to treat this with a degree of respect as a historic project. Uh, so we followed the National Park Service uh, Preservation Standards for Historic Rehabilitation. And it's been, a, it's been a very exhausting process, I would say. We started in 2014 and just finished really you know, earlier this year. Um, but once we, once we started uncovering uh, these cabins, the additions and the deferred maintenance and all that, we, we quickly realized that the cabins were not initially built to last 80 years, much less the next 80 years. So we uh, took on the attitude that we were making improvements to these cabins, modifications to these cabins that Missy Thompson herself would have done had she had the means at the time they were originally built. And so this is now the kind of environment that these artists experience whenever they, whenever they come to Log Haven. Um, it's just, again, a couple of miles from downtown. And each of these cabins is a little bit different, uh, which adds a bit of quirkiness to it, which I think is pretty nice. And so it's home now, or it was home to, to artists. The first residency started uh, in in February, these are some photos that were taken prior to the first residency, but started in February of this year, which is not really the ideal time to start your first official residency at an artist residency. Um, so that one ha unfortunately had to, had to end early, um, but we, we were able to get kind of a preview of what the space would be like a little bit earlier before some of the other newer buildings were built um, during the 2019 Big Ears Music Festival. Um, so we had um, some of the biggest names of that festival came. So Rhiannon Giddens opened what would become the inaugural, I guess it was the uh, Log Haven series at Big Ears in one of the cabins. And like a lot of things, like today, uh, these things have been moved into a virtual format right now. So uh, the Big Ears Festival and the Log Haven series and things associated with it have moved online, including um, live streaming from some of these cabins. So this is an event that will happen uh, a week from today uh, live stream from the from the Log Haven res residency. So these are artists who are using the space, um, but it's not active as a residency currently. Um, but regardless, I think with the with the birth of this artist residency, it's really started a new chapter in the history of the place, and it's one that uh, it'll inevitably overtake the predecessors as previous eras um, in significance and importance as the years go by. So as part of the next chapter of Log Haven. Um, we've been involved in a number of ground up projects, which has been a nice departure from those cabins that we've worked on for so many years. Our work on these new buildings started as part of the Battlefield Loop effort. This is one of those five zoom in areas. So the Log Haven sits right at the center of this page. Um, so we, we wanted to develop a strategy of how this new chapter of the site would play out over time. And we wanted to make sure that it would be something that was a progressive reflection of a current era and not a a kitschy recreation of 1930s log cabins. But we still wanted to preserve the character of the space. We looked at the existing cabins um, and kind of how they relate to the site, how interior 
uh, spaces relate to kind of outdoor terraces and how these spaces relate to other outdoor spaces within within the area. We tried to think about how to kind of reinterpret this and layer it into a more modern landscape approach and a more modern uh, design approach to those existing or those new buildings. We also wanted to look at the materiality of the existing buildings for inspiration, not for what materials they are necessarily, but for really how they perform. But for instance, in each of these cabins, we have this stone base that sets up a datum um, for the logs which sit on top and start to kind of overlap at the corner and transfer load down into, the, uh, into those foundations below. We wanted to think about how those materials could be reinterpreted in different ways. So how we could come up with a more refined approach to how stone is used or, or wood. Um, and you know, one of the subcontractors on the site during a, a job meeting one day told a, a dry joke, I guess. He said, do you know why Davy Crockett lived in a log cabin? And I said, I don't, I don't know. And he said, because he didn't have a sawmill. So the you know, the, the punchline of that is there are no sawmills that existed at that time, but we have access to those things now. So we wanted to use the tools that we've got and uh, come up with a material strategy that was reflective of that. There were also a, a series of uh, important and significant trees, a majestic stand of oak trees that existed on the site, also a row of hemlocks that were we wanted to preserve. That was part of the character of the place, and we were asked to preserve the character so that any resident over the past however many years of Log Haven could instantly come back and recognize that this is this was their home. Um, and we also wanted to preserve the character of an existing uh, road too, a single road that's very narrow that accesses the the, uh, the cabins along Log Haven Drive um, and it's lined with with large oak trees as well. So access for fire trucks for instance would be something that's difficult. So that became um, one of the constraints along with those trees that set up um, of a, I guess, a, a series of constraints that we would deal with as we would design uh, options for how to uh, address programmatic needs, which included administration space, a shared studio space, shared um, living, dining space as well for the residents. And, uh, and this is the site plan right now, how this works. The row of hemlock trees is maintained. We have circulation around either side of that, uh, maintaining this, the narrow uh, shape of the road. So as we get past this gate, which separates some of the more public spaces outside towards the road from the private spaces that are to the east where the residents will be. Um, and on the site, we also have maintenance uh, facility that's been added and one of the uh, historic cabins as well. This one will be the last one to be renovated as part of the future phase. Uh, so we, we also really wanted to focus on um, scale and materiality as we worked throughout the process. We worked with models. We worked with kind of full scale mock-ups and things. And we tried to study things at full scale as well as we were moving so that we had a, a good understanding um, of what we were doing. So it helped us make those design decisions. Um, this led to a materials palette that you see here. So this is a combination of zinc um, and milled Akoya, a milled Akoya rain screen, which is a, kind of a, a treated wood system. Um, and that uh, gives way to larger openings. These are mahogany openings that are nine and a half feet tall and 12 feet wide. Um, and that all sits on this bluestone base um, here as well, which is a more refined version of that kind of rustic base that the cabins had. Um, and then this bronze handrail and guardrail, which wraps the building, replacing the historic kind of wood pickets, uh, more rustic approach to the other cabins. So this is the uh, approach of the building right now, the, the axis uh, up and into what is now a, a kind of gallery space that separates the studio space from those more private functions over on the, on the other side. <clears throat> and that uh, interior gallery space leads to a terrace on the back side, and that terrace overlooks Cherokee Cove, which is that space in between High Ground Park and, uh, and Log Haven. You can see here also how the bluestone gives way to this bronze gate to provide that separation, but still visual connection between those more public spaces of the site and into the private areas of Lockheed. And we, um, we also worked with the lighting designer, site studio in, in Brooklyn. This is the approach the residents will see as they approach from their cabins. So we wanted to create um, a kind of um, modest lighting approach that would let the building become a beacon or a lantern. At, at night as they approach uh, into their uh, living space and through the more private spaces. Moving inside the building, we also wanted to take cues from the cabins themselves. So we uh, draw, drew and analyzed some of the spaces, the larger spaces within some of the existing cabins to try to get an understanding of how they operate, both in material and in scale. 
Um, and we started to do our own design options for how we would design public or shared communal spaces um, for living and dining, um, which in this case, living is separated by a bluestone fireplace, the dining room's on the other side. And we also took cues from the existing cabins where the rafters are these log rafters, in this case, replaced with these white oak uh, milled rafters, which conceal a really smart uh, ceiling system with acoustical batting, uh, sprinklers are concealed within that, lights, speakers, et cetera. So it's a really a more modern um, reflection of what's happening in some of those other spaces. And uh, moving out to the, to the gallery space, um, we have uh, the uh, first exhibit within this is an exhibit on Log Haven, some of the kind of eclectic people. This is Missy Thompson right here. So the exhibit's telling stories about some of the people that, um, that, that occupied the space over time. Um, and the doors slide open to provide that connection out to the terrace with the bronze guardrail and overlooking that. So the ridge you see in the distance is the ridge of, of High Ground Park. And moving past that gallery space, um, there is a multidisciplinary studio space here which accommodates music performances, um, fine arts, um, any of that. So it's a space that's designed to accommodate a lot of different functions um, with north facing skylights. And there's another gallery as well. There's a vitrine gallery that's accessed off of this space. That vitrine gallery uh, becomes really uh, something that has rotating exhibits that can be more of a public face. So this face is out to the street um, and gives an indication of the activity that's happening uh, inside. And while we, uh, we, we designed the space in the studio to be as flexible as possible, we, we knew that it can never be designed to accommodate um, you know, all uses perfectly. So we were asked to design the first two discipline specific studios uh, on the campus of Log Haven. So this site map gives an indication of kind of where we are. The cabins sit at the end of Log Haven Drive. This is the gateway building. And then moving down through the woods is a connection down to the visual and performing arts uh, studios. And so in this case, what we proposed were uh, kind of uh, companion buildings that were designed for very different functions. So we have a performing arts studio that um, has a sprung floor for dance, um, and you have a visual art studio that has things like uh, accommodations with ventilation and things for screen printing or any other uh, painting and things like that. So two buildings that are similar but very different in how they perform. And trees were an important part of this as well. This was formerly a home site. It wasn't a cabin site. It was a, a, a later home uh, that had been removed. Uh, there weren't many trees on the site, so it was important to protect the ones that were um, that were significant. So there was a significant oak tree that existed here. The original home pad of the, of the uh, site uh, was there. So we started to study how we can access these two studio buildings from what was the existing home site and allow the buildings themselves to project out into the landscape, uh, sliding over a concrete base uh, kind of out into the canopy of the existing trees. And the, the ubiquitous gable form that's common to all the buildings at Log Haven was also accepted here. Um, and it gives us a function as well um, for, the, for the performing arts studio as it gives us the height we need for dance performances and things like that. Um, the interior of these spaces are quite different. We have uh, the lights that are surface mounted to allow for these types of performances, whereas and that's in the performing arts. The visual arts has suspended track lighting with multiple color temperatures integrated north facing skylight as well. So, um, and then from the material standpoint, we also wanted this to be um, in the same way, a bit of a departure from the, the historic cabin. So this is kind of the next uh, chapter or iteration away from those historic materials and that palette. So in, in this case, the foundation of stone foundations is traded for a board form concrete foundation wall. Um, the black uh, stained siding that's attached to the outside of the building um, is you know, designed in a more minimal way with a, a roof form that does not have an overhang. So it keeps the volume pure. And this is the approach from the cabins as you come down from Log Haven Drive. So you can see those buildings sliding out over that board form concrete base. And uh, another intention of the cabins was to limit their exposure upon approach. So approaching from Log Haven or approaching from the cabin that exists along the drive right adjacent to this, we have a, a limited exposure um, of those cabins to minimize their footprint and visibility from other spaces. And um, inside, they're, they're you know, pretty, pretty stark spaces. This one is space for performance, uh, building again stretching out into the can canopy of existing trees. So it really feels like you're in a tree house within these spaces. Visual uh, art studio as well within the trees with views out to the distance to the, to the Smoky Mountains uh, beyond. 
So I'm going to stay within the urban wilderness for the for the last project. This one starts in a part of our city um, that has a pretty complicated history. And it's a history that's been forever changed by urban renewal and by the, the automobile culture that's associated with that. This is James White Parkway and it's really, I think, I think of it as the exclamation point on Knoxville's urban renewal experiment. At the time, East Knoxville was home to a thriving African-American uh, business community. There were more than 100 African-American owned businesses uh, here and 90% of it 90% of those businesses lined a road called East Vine Avenue from Central uh, Street, which uh, I had shown earlier, to what's now a road called Martin Luther King. Um, and this area was also the heart of, uh, of the cultural heart of the African American community. The Gym Theater hosted performances from Billie Holiday and Cab Calloway. Um, during uh, segregation, um, it was also the Knoxville's Black Movie House. Um, the Gym Theater was located right here. Uh, it's, it's at the intersection of uh, East Vine and Central. In this 1936 map, you can see East Vine, you can see this first creek, which was a creek that was a kind of notoriously unruly creek that flooded pretty often. Um, the same year that this map was made, uh, the Knoxville Housing Authority was officially established. The Knoxville Housing Authority um, produced a report in 1939, just three, three years after this was done, and it it uh, identified housing along this corridor as undergoing rapid deterioration. And that really, I think, unofficially ushered in the area, the era of uh, urban renewal in Knoxville. So just a, a year after the report was issued, the first slum clearance projects began in East Knoxville. Uh, this one for Austin Homes, it, it uh, demolished 47 homes and it displaced 60 uh, families along this area of First Creek and East Fine Avenue to make the project. By 1958, that creek had been tamed by a new massive infrastructure project. It was also led by the Knoxville Housing Authority. Um, this article describes that project and it also uh, mentions uh, what would become James White Parkway. Uh, and it describes it as a, a downtown loop highway with clover leaves. Uh, this one also displaced another 362 families, uh, some of whom would be accommodated in what this article called a new low rent housing project for Negroes and it would be built adjacent to the, that Austin Homes project. So other projects followed over the next, uh, next couple of decades. Um, one of them here is the Civic Coliseum project built in 1961. This one displaced another 72 families, nine businesses and two churches. So by the time urban renewal ended in Knoxville in 1974, pretty much the entire African-American business community had been, had been wiped out. And by 1978, this downtown loop highway had extended all the way to the edge of the river, uh, becoming a barrier between what was left of the African American community and downtown Knoxville. This overlay shows what was East Vine Avenue to Central, um, which is, is gone totally, and even the name of the road is gone. So everything that was built along that corridor is lost to history. And uh, by the 1980s, that downtown loop highway had been extended all the way through. The first two miles of a planned five-mile bypass for Knoxville's congested highways was, was built. And that's where it ended. Two miles of it ended in a place that we call the terminus. Um, and it sat that way for until, until about right now. Um, we've had some really good leadership in our city through the years. Uh, in 2015, uh, our mayor, Mayor Madeline Rojero, she started negotiations with the Tennessee Department of Transportation uh, to stop the extension of this road um, through some of the uh, you know, hills of South Knoxville. Um, and she was successful with that. In 2017, she announced an agreement with Tennessee Department of Transportation, which transferred the terminus of James White Parkway, everything here south um, to Knoxville, to the city. And right after that, they issued a request for qualifications. So through what's known as now the Urban Wilderness Gateway Project, we have an opportunity to remake this big piece of urban infrastructure and try at least to make some amends uh, for some of the past mistakes that have happened and provide a better connection between uh, these urban neighborhoods. So to understand this project, you really have to understand it in the context of the urban wilderness. Um, so this map shows the way the urban wilderness looked at the time of the issue of the RFQ. So you can see the battlefield loop here with Log Haven projects that I've, that I've talked a little bit about. Uh, downtown Knoxville over here, and then the South Loop to the right. So um, the uh, South Loop con contains places like Meads Quarry, which I talked about. It also has a, uh, 
a nature center, a wildlife management area, and all this is connected with just tons and tons of uh, hiking and biking trails as well. Um, so when you start to think about this area, the Urban Wilderness Gateway at this spot, when you couple that with some of the other planned connections that exist, um, you can see that there's a lot of potential with this about thousand acre project or so to provide connections and business opportunities within what is really one of Knoxville's most uh, economically depressed areas. But as written, the focus of the RFQ was just the end. It was the terminus and into some of the trails of the South Loop. So uh, what we did was we, we worked with um, the city to try to expand the scope of this. And we were working again with Port Urbanism on this project as well. So working with Port, we were able to make a, an argument that we should provide a connection across the length of James White Parkway. We should negotiate with the Department of Transportation to take more than what they had given us. And more importantly, we should provide that connection over to East Knoxville, to Morningside Park, and use this project to really provide connections between these neighborhoods that have been so dislocated by this, uh, this piece of infrastructure. So we uh, presented this to uh, the Tennessee Department of Transportation and present, presented it to the city and, uh, before that, and they agreed and they allowed us to kind of expand the scope of the project. Um, so we, uh, we were able to really focus on this full 2.2 mile corridor, which is a linear park really with 113 new acres of developable, developable opportunities connecting to these existing neighborhoods in different ways and in connecting uh, the urban of Morningside Park down to the uh, wilderness of Baker Creek Preserve. So we set a set of goals like you see here. We wanted to transform the northbound lanes of James White Parkway and I'll talk about that more in a minute. We wanted a continuous bike and pedestrian greenway. Um, and we wanted to punctuate the length of that corridor with these unique moments and experiences and to find access points into the surrounding neighborhoods. And we wanted to do that all in a way which transformed the nature of this underutilized piece of infrastructure. So, um, so we worked with Port to develop these series of diagrams and the idea of this was to uh, kind of change the idea of this being as just a threshold moment of you stop at the end of the highway and you move into the, the wilderness portion of this. Um, so we convinced the city to re-envision this as something that was more of a procession, a kind of experience through the park as you leave downtown Knoxville and enter, and enter this space. And we did that through uh, you know, creating this linear park, which is, uh, uh, provides access and make connections along the le length of the corridor. And it's all bound to a framework of continuous amenities um, and, uh, and infrastructure. And it has these nodes and destinations uh, distributed along the length of the 2.2 miles. So this part was what was presented to TDOT, and we didn't know if we'd have success with it, but somehow they agreed to do that. And they uh, gave us, we've, we've now, the city now has ownership of all of the land all the way to Anita Drive, and we have an agreement with the Department of Transportation to provide that connection over to uh, Morningside Park as part of a future phase. Um, <clears throat> the first phase is associated with this area in orange. So that first phase does include everything from Baker Creek all the way through to the terminus, the terminus you see here. And it also includes that one stretch of Greenway, which provides that important connection into um, those adjacent neighborhoods. Future phases will include the, uh, the greening of the entire corridor um, and that connection over to Morningside Park, East Knoxville and downtown. And the big idea really is pretty simple. So the northbound lanes on James White Parkway are underutilized right now. So we're gonna take that traffic, move it over into the southbound lanes and take over all of this space um, for two different types of greenways. One that accesses the urban areas and one that's a more kind of linear park experience through the space. And you know, this is, this is a big opportunity, I think for us. And it's something that other cities have really taken advantage of around the world. So they've use this as an opportunity to remake their own in, uh, pieces of underutilized infrastructure in places like Atlanta or New York. Everybody's familiar with, uh, with these projects which have, have become economic catalysts and become tourism drivers. And also uh, they provide amenities, uh, recreational amenities and opportunities for local residents as well. So for us, the design portion of this project really starts here. It starts at, at the terminus. Um, <clears throat> So working again with Port, we started to set up these goals for what's gonna happen. We're gonna enhance the infrastructural character of that. So what we're doing is we're not turning our back on this as a piece of infrastructure. We're trying to use this as this kind of you know, giant sublime experience of entering into the space. And we use some of the elements of that 
Um, and we try to maintain that kind of transition at the bottom of the, uh, of the overpass into the wilderness of Baker Creek Preserve. So from overhead, you can see that we're using the existing uh, roadway. We're just simply restriping um, some of this uh, as we create event spaces and things along that area. Um, so within looking at the plan of the terminus, you can see the greenway that connects to those existing neighborhoods. Within the terminus itself, we have new parking that exists on the, on the roadway and that accesses uh, amenities that exist around here as you pass through kids bike circuit and a ride center and then into a woodland playground with adjacent bathrooms and things. Zooming into that area, you can see how this ride center structure, this new pavilion really becomes a mediator between an extension of a roadway that accesses other spaces within the park um, to some of these uh, play areas and uh, including the um, kids bike circuit. So this is something that um, was an important part of the project. So there are great mountain biking trails that exist here, but people like my children or even me are scared to get on those. So they are gonna get on these little ones here and try to learn how to do this. Um, so zooming on into Baker Creek Preserve, um, this project's already started to be a catalyst for some development within the area as well. So you have this um, abandoned vacant church that's already been, um, uh, the redevelopment project's been started on that, which will bring um, ho housing, you know, lodging for people who would use some of these amenities, but also um, things like a uh, brewery and restaurants and things like that. So that activity is happening here. And as you see from the rendering, that um, allows the, the new activity and, and kind of economic catalyst within the area to be separated from all the mountain biking trails here by the new park. So spaces that exist at the end of Baker Creek Preserve include um, a woodland play area, an event lawn, and then a bike park here, which is just recently uh, completed. It's also flanked by a new pavilion, which I'll talk a little bit about, more about in a minute. So this is the experience that we'll have whenever the, the full project's completed, uh, phase one, or let's call it bid package one, not confuse it. Bid package one is gonna be finished in about uh, probably a month or so. Um, bid package two includes these new pavilions again that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, this is a picture from the same view taken just a couple weeks ago uh, when I was on site. So you can see the edge of the bike park and then the pad for where that pavilion will be here. I'm gonna see if this will work. This is blurry video of uh, me riding my bike through here. So you can see the transformation of this that's begun all the way through as you move through and underneath this out this underpass, which will become a new kind of outdoor room uh, through the greenway with uh, spaces over to the right, our existing kind of play areas uh, over there. So moving through to where that church that's gonna be redeveloped is, the uh, event lawn as well, and up to, again, apologies for the blurriness. I'm off my bike at this point, um, to the new bike park. So this has become a real kind of driver for tourism within our, within our city. So programming uh, becomes an important part of this as well, obviously. Um, I wanna zoom back out and talk a little bit about that. So uh, we have these nodes that exist. We wanted to distribute program along the length of the corridor to reduce pressure from those, where those spaces are. So we have the spaces at Baker Creek Preserve at the end and at the terminus where we know there's gonna be uh, a lot of activity, but we wanna distribute different program, whether it's parking or uh, you know, bathrooms or dog parks and things like that along the length of the corridor. So we proposed, this way to do that so that we really can distribute that pressure and create moments and opportunities along the length of the 2.2 miles. Uh, so two of the primary nodes um, that exist are the one at the terminus and the one at Baker Creek. So two pavilions are proposed here. Um, they're similar in language, but they're different in form and function. So at the James White Parkway terminus, uh, the ride center is programmed and it weaves its way underneath the existing overpass while the one at the Baker Creek area really kind of becomes a space that frames what happens um, at the bottom of that event line. So zooming in to the one at uh, James White Parkway, we can see how that spreads around the existing structure of the overpass. Um, it's a <clears throat> covered area at the front really serves as an open air pavilion, which is adjacent to where the uh, event space is. Um, and really, we, it's got a ride center and a bathroom integrated in it as well. And it's pretty simple structurally. We have a shade structure that wraps around a sub, substructure that attaches to a primary structure. And all that just layers on this. We, to get it through the Department of Transportation, we had to actually call it highway sculpture, which is another story that I'm not going to share too much about. But um, ride center at the end with wayfinding integrated and bathroom over here. And it gets pretty hot in Knoxville. So um, really, this is primarily a shade structure. So what we did was... Um, <clears throat> we uh, proposed shade canopies, which would stretch between the di diagonal framework of the existing structure, kind of go from the bottom of the trusses up to the top. 
And what that does is it, it uh, provides a bit of volume within the space of the building, provides shade, obviously. Um, but the trusses themselves, it covers these trusses, which allow us to span across that ride center space without using columns, which was um, always a goal of ours. So looking here, you can see how the shade structure stretches down at the area where we're providing uh, privacy from uh, the edge where uh, cars will pass through. The uh, perforated metal skin is what it is, comes down and provides that connection. We lift up at the center to provide access from inside to all of those amenities and playgrounds and things like that. And wayfinding is again, very important. We're working with a local graphic designer here as well, um, trying to integrate branding uh, into what's happening here. So this is the ride center branding wall itself. And that also trickles down to these board form concrete bathrooms with inset uh, steel uh, signage within. And again, similar language over here at the Baker Creek uh, Pavilion as well. So this is the event lawn with that, uh, with that space flanking the bottom of it. So it becomes really a backdrop for performances and things like that. And it sits between a woodland play area and a children's pump track. So it provides shade opportunities for those parents that are coming to watch their kids play. And uh, this is a view of that backdrop as you would see from the event lawn itself. We just walked the site with the city of Knoxville um, officials to check the status of the bid package one and prepare for bid package two. So these projects will be advertised for bid in January. So in conclusion, again, I just wanted to talk a little bit about our place um, and share some stories about that and what we do. And uh, I, think, I think cities like ours um, sit kind of at the sweet spot in terms of potential. And it's really about, again, the size of the city. We have an opportunity to have kind of an outsized impact, I think, on the, the places where we work. Um, as architects also, I wanna say that I think we're in a, in a unique position to lead the change and lead the charge in transforming our communities into the places that we really want them to be. Um, and I think for us, I think having a good understanding of the history and context of these places where we work helps us make informed decisions and informed arguments um, as we go through this process. So thank you. And Brandon, is, or would you be available for questions for a minute or two? Of course, yeah, sure. Okay, so if you have questions for Brandon, um, unmute your mic and go ahead and ask. Kind of hard to do via Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> Brandon, just answer all the questions. appreciate you being on today. Yeah, thank you for having me. I really do appreciate it. It was, again, wonderful to, to, um, to chair the jury this year. I love seeing the work, um, and I, I appreciate your time. I don't have any questions. Ask one question? Go um, ahead. What's been the evolution of the city? Has the city been on board with everything that you've been doing all along, or has there been a like an evolution from start to finish of where you guys, or you guys aren't finished right now, obviously, but you know, what was the yeah. ramp up speed for their, that kind of collaboration is really amazing. Yeah, well, in, in our case, I, I, think, um, I think the relationships that we have with people in the city really helps, but we didn't have those relationships until we started working with the city. Um, and so our, our entry into working with the city on city projects really started with the Battlefield Loop project, which was a project, uh, a design project that was funded by the Aslan Foundation. So they funded our work in anticipation of trying to create a plan that we could then share with the city. So that's exactly what happened. So we said, we've got some ideas about what can happen um, in these areas. What do you think, basically? And, and so the city then became a partner as we continue to develop that. And as, as projects have spun out of that, they've been projects that are on city owned property. And these are projects that are, um, it's a unique relationship we have with the foundation in the city now where the foundation um, covers the design fees associated with uh, the design of these projects and in, in, um, in trade, I guess, with the city promising that they'll execute the projects in that way. So, you know, we've got to work with the city to develop those, those projects at a, at a budget, which is a struggle, a budget that they, that they build parks at, but, um, we also have to do it in a way that really elevates design. So the foundation, the task for them, to us, is to try to elevate the expectations of uh, people who live in the city. So you know, we've 
I don't know if other cities are, are like ours, but it's, it feel, we feel like that people in our city historically have always said, like, we don't need that. We don't need, we don't need that much. You know, this is all just good enough. So just good enough isn't just good enough anymore. So the foundation is trying to insert themselves into places to where they can create projects and places that raise expectations between the city. So the city is really up to their game. So the project, the Urban Skateway Park project, was a public request for qualifications where we then team report, team civil engineer, traffic engineer, all that stuff, and put together a team. The foundation is not involved. But the relationships established with the city through other projects gave them the confidence that we could do what we needed to do in that case. And that, I think, continues to happen. And that's part of what I'm talking about, about the size of our city. I think the relationships that we have with people like, you know, all the way up to the office of the mayor, these are people that we can talk to um, at any time. So if it's a larger city, you have a harder time getting access to people like that. Smaller city, you're not going to have the resources to be able to do projects like this. Great. Thank you. Great stuff. I have Thank you. a question too. Um, you talked, you had some really elaborate, it seems, community engagement um, sessions, which I, I was really impressed by. Um, can you talk a little bit about that, um, how that informed some of your decisions, some of the input that you got from the community? Yeah, and the image I shared was one of um, Battlefield Loop, but I'll talk about the urban wilderness instead, um, because the community engagement was more significant on that project. Um, and it was a, a struggle. I mean, these, um, a struggle because we're sometimes we we think that people like what we're doing we're like this is a great idea this is going to be great for the community but not everybody agrees with that and we had to learn that through basically taking our lumps through a series of um, of meetings that we had which are not big elaborate public meetings they're literally me and the city two city employees going to a community center and meeting with six residents of a surrounding neighborhood who are you know ready to Are there any other questions for Brandon? Uh, cut our heads off because so they can get hurt. Did you hear? I don't know if you can hear me or not. <laughs> nope. Sorry, internet connection is unstable. Okay, are you I don't know if that caught up, Kate. I, my internet seems to be cutting out a little bit there. Yep, yep, you're caught back up. Okay, sorry about that. I don't know if you heard the answer to that question about community engagement. Heather, do you want do you have a follow up? No, I heard all of it except for the very last bit. That was kind of what I was wondering because there's a lot of aspiration in there, but you have to get kind of in the nitty gritty with um, individuals and that can be very challenging. So. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure some of you know. I mean, it is. not Like I said, not everybody, it, not everybody can come to a consensus on something that most people might think is a good idea. And so you can't just say it's a good idea. You have to listen and you have to adapt. And I think that's what we've done in, in certain cases. We have changed different aspects of what we're doing to accommodate some of those needs. In most cases, I think it makes it better. I and mean, that's what we're trying to do is, is really kind of be a partner with these neighborhoods. We're not trying to just come in and change everything. Very, very nice work. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Any other questions for Brandon? Well, if there are no other questions, Brandon, thank you for your time. Thank you for this presentation today. And thank you for the, uh, your participation in the jury. Um, and uh, everyone, to everyone, all of the other attendees, thank you for, for attending um, this session. And also for those that were in on the annual meeting, thank you for, for your participation.